Hello, Julie. Hi, I've got Mark here. Hello, Mark. Scoot over just a little bit so we can see your smiling face. <laughs> we got that one, again. so I want to close out this one. So. We're juggling mess. <laughs> oh, of course, it happens. Well, welcome, everyone. I see lots of people are still popping in. Um, welcome to Escapees Webinars. My name is George Ann, and I'm going to be our host for this webinar. I am the marketing director for Escapees RV Club, and I kind of helped start this program. And for now, I'm serving as a host, but we're looking forward to growing the program more and getting some more people involved in the future. Um, if you have any questions during this webinar, make sure that you use the chat or the Q&A option, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Um, tonight, we're chatting with Mark and Julie Bennett of RV Love. You can see their lovely faces here. This dynamic couple has made a name for themselves in the RV industry by simply being who they are and doing what they love. Um, will you guys take a moment to introduce yourselves? Oh, sorry, unmute right. ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't want to be over talking. So, so Mark and Julie, RV Love, uh, we've been on the road full time for a, little, a bit over three years and um, absolutely loving it. We've traveled to 49 states. We just need to get to Alaska, yep. the only remaining state. And um, absolutely loving the life. Um, Living, working, and traveling full time all the way. So I think that's one of the things that, that is exciting whenever we meet people about. First of all, it's surprising to a lot of people that we still are being, <laughs> that we are being full time at such a young age. But then it's even more surprising when they know that we still work and that we did that amount of travel while still working full time. So that is funny. Yeah, just this morning we went into or, or last night we talked to a few people like. So you're full-time, and they first they have to get their head around the idea of full-time RVing, and then they have to get their head around the fact that you work. You're not so. retired, yeah. We like to bend brains a bit. <laughs> oh, yes, oh, yes. Well, I really appreciate you guys taking the time, making the time for us tonight. Um, and for those of you who are still hopping in, looks like we've got about 10 more people in the last minute or so. Welcome. We are about to kick off our webinar tonight with Mark and Julie of RV Love. And they're going to talk with us a little bit about how they made the transition from full-time careers and a sticks and bricks type of situation to bringing their work on the road and making a name for themselves and doing what they love. All right. Thank so, you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so what made you guys decide to leave behind your home and everything else you had to full-time travel? Well, I think we just – wanted to get more out of our life than our regular stick and break lifestyle. I mean, we, we had a nice home and a nice neighborhood and everything was nice. You know, it was all good, but uh, we just we were so limited with vacation time and modern jobs in America, especially. Mm -hmm. And to be able to make more of that and be able to have more freedom, more flexibility and be able to see more, travel more, um, you know, the RV lifestyle is a fantastic fit for that. And we, with travel, we wanted to also be able to take our dog with us. And so an RV is fantastic for that as well. That's awesome. Yes. Oh, you just want to say something, Julie? Well, I think also the thing I want to add there is that we're the kind of people that like to consciously create our life. You know, we're not really the kind of people that just let life happen to us. So when we really think about what we would like to have in the future, we really take a lot of time to sit down and discuss it and plan for it and then take the steps to make it happen. We don't, we don't believe life happens by accident. That's awesome. Um, okay, so then with that in mind, when, how did you guys, so, so Mark, you had a full-time job whenever you guys decided to start traveling, and then I know Julie had some things going on that she decided to rework whenever you hit the road. Um, Mark, how did you bring your full-time career on the road with you? Well, you know, it's interesting because it's taken one step back further than that, is I had a job that was very technical in that I was supporting people out of state, and it was all online, and yet I couldn't get that employer to allow me to work remotely from home. And I've wanted to work from home for many years. So I've, I, to Julie's point about living intentionally, I went and sought out a role that I could work remotely being because I wanted to be able to work from home. Once I had that job, you know, five, six months into that, I started re well, we started reevaluating what home is mm -hmm. and it's home is really just us and being together and in a state of mind more than a physical location. And so because my job was fully remote, I didn't need to go into an office. That's when the RV lifestyle became that much more of a reality. You just start realizing, oh, is connectivity possible? Yes. Oh, can I do this? Yes. Yes. You start getting all the yes answers. And then you can take that remote, any pretty much any job that you can do from home, you can do on the road. Yeah. 
That's awesome. So how did you how did you manage your work obligations once you went mobile? Well, I think that, balancing the yeah, okay. That is one of the challenges, you know, because a lot of the people that you meet on the road um, that are still working are usually self-employed or contractors or otherwise have a lot of freedom in their schedules. Whereas I had a regular eight to five job where I was expected to be at a desk connected every day, um, five days a week. And um, so it affects your travel a little bit in that you need to make sure you travel around where you're going to have connectivity. Um, and then so you can be on those hours. And then when it's really funny because when you're on West Coast versus East Coast, you work totally different hours than you do. It felt and, like a uh, different job. Sometimes. It makes it feel like a different <laughs> job, which really keeps it fresh and interesting. Um, so, but yeah, I think that's one of the biggest keys is, you know, just, you know, monitoring your travel around being able to be there for your jobs and be at your desk all the time. What did you want to add to that? Yeah, well, it, because we were very cognizant that we we're in a fortunate position that Mark's job was uh, fully remote in that we it enabled and supported this lifestyle we had to put that first and so it, it, it really dictated our travels to a large degree we, we mostly traveled on weekends or during the summer in daylight saving we could do some travel after hours while it was still light so that really dictated our travel day so sometimes if you're traveling a long way um, you might spend most of the weekend driving and not really seeing a place so that also meant that we slowed our travels down so we would try to stay two or three weeks in a location so we really had time to explore it but because work came first I mean sometimes we just couldn't go to places we wanted to go to because it couldn't didn't have connectivity but you know that's a, pretty much a first world problem that we're not <laughs> complaining about because this is a choice that we had that a lot of other people don't have the option to do so it's uh but we were very very mindful and very respectful and appreciative that this is the job that makes this lifestyle possible for us. And therefore, Mark being at, at his desk, being productive, you know, doing his work and putting that first instead of wanting to go out hiking on a Monday instead of working, we just, you just didn't think that way. I think you've got a high work ethic and yeah, you can't think that way. It's just, you have to do what needs to be done too. Yeah. I have a really high value on work-life balance. And, and to that, to that, I also, that means that when work's done, that balance shifts completely to life side, right? And so when work is done, those hours are done, the computer shuts off, gets closed off, yeah. and I don't even look at it for the rest of the night. And that's actually, once I did tell people that I was <laughs> living in RV, it was easy to say, oh, well, I was, you know, after work, I went and hiked, you know, I didn't have cell coverage, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I actually didn't even tell a lot of people about the um, mobile lifestyle at first. So. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. I mean, I definitely, I, we were a conversation going on in one of the Facebook groups we managed earlier today about that very thing of sometimes it's hard to tell your employer you're working from an RV because that gives them an entirely different perception of what you do during the day. So, yeah, In fact, that was actually a real big thing for us is that when we did hit the road, I had only told a handful of people, just a couple people that had to know. Um, and for the most part, didn't want to tell very many people at all when we hit the road because I didn't want to plant a seed to them to have them pay extra attention. I didn't want to have them Thank monitoring that much closer. And yeah. it was six months or almost a year into the travels. And my boss was like, you know, Mark, you're one of the most connected people in this company. I've always been able to reach you during business hours. And, and so what's great is that when a couple of people said, oh, well, you work from the road. Oh, I could totally tell. I'm like, oh, really? How, when did you notice? Oh, it's been like two, three weeks, right? I'm like, no, it's been a year. You know, so, <laughs> it's, so it's good to have that under your belt before you start getting too many people know about it because then you just can have an answer like that that really puts them back into place. So. <laughs> That's awesome. That makes, that makes sense. And I'm glad that that really worked out for you very well. Um, and, you're, and like you said, it's a testament to your work ethic. That makes a huge difference. Um, and so, Julie, shifting to you, you left behind your job, but you still found a way to put your skills and talents that you had grown over your career into the work you do on the road. Um, on, your on your blog, you've talked about the importance of maintaining multiple income streams as well, and it's pretty smart advice. Um, how did you reach this conclusion, and how did, you, how did you make what you did in your more stable life work for you in your mobile life? Well, I'd always had a background. My whole career, I've been in marketing, communications, and writing. That's that's been my whole life, and that's what that's what I love. Um, when I was in Australia, I was self-employed for most of my life. But I moved here to the US eight years ago, and 
and I did get a job for a regular company and you know it's just some people are just not cut out for that <laughs> and I'm one of them I'm just more of an entrepreneurial creative type and and it's very nice to have the job with the regular salary and the benefits and all of that kind of thing but you know I'm just the kind of person who is like a square pig in a round hole and so when that was going on for me and there were some changes going on in my workplace and we were having the conversation about hitting the road and Mark was already working from home so we were we were actually already working from home together before we hit the road, yeah. which was a great uh, segue for us. We already knew we, we spent a lot of time together. We're really close. We like spending a lot of time together. And so it, Mark was amazingly supportive and said, you know what, you, you are really a creative. You want to go do your own thing again. I said, I do. So that's when I decided not to go look for another job, which was originally doing and decided to just go and do my own thing. But you know what my own thing was, I wasn't quite sure. And so really I think having the stability of Mark's income and his support allowed me to have some creative life and some freedom to experiment and explore and so you know part of that was you know setting up the blog RV Love and that and I just want to make it clear too that it's that never started as a business and it really isn't a business with there are some income streams from RV Love but it hasn't ever started out that way because it was more about sharing the journey and me creatively experimenting and getting back to more writing and learning how to make YouTube videos and how to tell stories and, and share them online and and that that's been fun. We always wanted that to be a fun and joyful part of our life and not to make it feel like work, if that makes sense. It, I just never wanted it to feel like a chore. And so um, getting back to your point about the multiple streams of income, I think that's also, you know, risk management is a big part of, you know, life, whether it's, you know, finances or income or even hitting the road in an RV, there are a lot of things to consider and weighing up the pros and cons and the risks of everything. And so having multiple streams of income is one way of like not having all of your eggs in one basket. So yeah, we were very dependent on Mark's income. That's definitely was the primary source that funded this lifestyle and has made it possible. Um, but by gradually over time, you know, I was doing some writing work and some consulting and coaching work. I did some marketing projects. Um, there was, I did some share trading on the side as well. I mean, there was Amazon affiliate program, that kind of a thing on RV Love. Um, YouTube channel gets a little bit of money. YouTube never makes as much money as people think, by the way. No. Don't it? <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of work for not a lot of money, but that's not why we did it. We did it for fun and sharing and, you know, like I said, creatively learning. But, but you know, over time that's grown and then you just get, you know, a little bit coming in from here and here and here and here and all they all come together and, and actually, you know, lots of little streams add up over time sure a bunch of little ones you know add up to a big one and what's great about that is for stability wise is that you're not as julie said you're not all eggs in one basket right. you know, so that if one of them is light for a month or two if this one was stronger it then up. it's fine you know where a lot of folks that they only have the single income stream there's a whole lot invested in that yeah. there's more risk in having all of it tied into one income than it is to having in multiple and that goes to a job. I mean, sometimes we yeah. think that actually having a regular job with an income, while all, we all like the benefits of that, knowing there's a certain amount of money coming in every month and benefits that go with that. But what, happen when, what happens if or when that job goes away and then the rug is pulled out from under you? And that, that is you know, a stressful situation for anyone. I think a lot of us have probably been through that. And that's what I love about self-employment and entrepreneurialism is it just gives you a chance to recreate and reinvent, you know, according to what you love, but according to where there's a need and where there's a market for it as well. That makes, that makes a whole lot of sense. And it's very, it's a very smart way to approach RVing for sure. Cause as you guys are, I'm sure are well aware, you never know what expenses may pop up as well. And so having that, that flexibility and that fluid um, income, you can, if you need to, you can hustle harder on, uh, I hate that word, but you can work a little bit harder. We <laughs> hate it too. Like, stop we worrying about the anti hustling. We need to create the anti hustle movement. That's a yeah. buzzword right now. Everyone's like, hustle, hustle. I'm like, no, this is not why we live this life. It's not no. to hustle. Never <laughs> stop hustling and just enjoy life. Yeah. Exactly. You know, to that same point, Dorian, is that when you do have some fluctuations in your income stream what's one of the other beauties of the rv lifestyle is that you have that flexibility of your expenditure as well because yeah. in a regular traditional stick and brick type lifestyle most of your expenses are fixed you have a larger mm -hmm. mortgage or a larger rent payment or stuff like that 
in in the RV world, most of your expenses are variable. So it's usually fuel or campground stays and stuff like that, yeah. or some of your big hitters. Depending on if you modify your travel style, those expenses can come down in really a day, let, you know, let alone in a month. So. Yep. All right. So, so, so again, talking more about these multiple income streams with you guys in particular, how did you narrow down what it was that you, the things you wanted to put your energy and your focus into to try and, and bring some income in? How did you make those decisions? Well, for us, you know, I think we mentioned earlier, we create our life very intentionally. And, and so all aspects of life and that's work and, and how we want to spend our energy. And, you know, with Mark's work, getting to a point where it was becoming unsustainable for him, he's been so um, focused on work-life balance and health. That's one of our um, high values is when that was starting to be compromised, we had to start having some big conversations about, you know, what, what we were doing all this for and, and what, what needed to change and so we took a step back and I think just both really got out a pen and paper and started writing out a list of well what we something needs to change this can't keep going because it's not sustainable on, on any level and what are we good at what is our career histories what is our background what are our strengths what are our skills and so really taking inventory of all of that and being very um strategic maybe or just very and then combining that with what what we're passionate about and what we love so it's just really finding we didn't want to just go and just do what looked like the next thing or the next opportunity because yeah. I've done that before in business and I've come to learn the hard way that that's not necessarily the way you meant to go don't just go with what sort of maybe looks easy right in front of you because is that really going to get you where to where you want to go in the longer term in life and so we really took you know, I think probably a year of talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, about what what do we really want? So we didn't rush it by any stretch of the imagination. But, you know, when you sit down and you really look at what your skills and talents are in the world and how can you best harness those and use those to be of service and to help other people and do it in a way that's that's joyful for you and, and doesn't it doesn't feel like work, you know, where it's just... Um, you know, that, that's, that's what we're both about because that's a win-win for everyone. When you're doing what you love and you're doing something that's adding value and creating value for other people and being of service, I mean, that's, it's like you're just getting paid to have fun. <laughs> you know, that's, that's when work feels like play, when, when it doesn't feel like such an, such an effort. Did that, I don't know if that really answered your question. Is that kind of... <laughs> You've gone... There it goes. It wasn't unmuting. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think so. I think that does. Um, yeah, definitely. And so, you, like as you mentioned, Mark no longer has the full-time um, remote job that he had previously. He left it. Congratulations. I hope you're enjoying your freedom a little bit more. Um, <laughs> but with that in mind, how do the two of you work together to maintain this, this financial setup that you have? Um, and what kind of tips might you have for others that are trying to do something like this? Yeah, well, um, and thank you for the congratulatory message. It was it was interesting because I've almost always worked for other people. I've had, when I've had worked for myself, it's usually been a secondary income on top of it. And uh, I think looking back, you know, we just, we absolutely loved doing RV Love because we love being able to help people. Most all of our videos, we try to have something of value for the viewer, you know, Education. what's, what is in it for them. And that's yeah. the way we've always approached our content. But we love that because when people do meet us, they usually greet us with a thank you and not a, you know hello and so that's so intrinsically rewarding um and there's to us there's so many other measures of success you know freedom health and you know love love and these Thanks things love are, and RV love. <laughs> these are things that are so much more important to us than the financial rewards and so even though my income was you know the primary stream it just was no longer sustainable my health was starting to sacrifice mm. my i was starting my very strong work-life balance started to crack because there was a lot of pressures that I was trying to help the company meet some goals and I was allowing it to slip thinking it was short term and then it just it was too much and so we started to separate and you know to the point about you know the flexibility of the expenses we just knew that mm. this lifestyle would allow us that security of being able to you know just cut back our expenses when at mm. the same time that my income cut back and then just with the what we talked about earlier about having multiple streams we mm -hmm. didn't have a lot of other streams but it was enough to at least bridge the gap so if you mm -hmm. have to you know if you need this amount 
but you're already getting this amount, then all you really need to do is come up with this, just what's mm -hmm. in between. And so we just needed to figure out something that was something we were passionate about, something that we were really a great fit for that could bridge that gap. Um, mm -hmm. so. and, and I think too, it's like knowing what your skills and your talents are, but also knowing that these things take time. I think it takes a long time to build a blog or a YouTube channel or anything like that, or any small business. I mean, I've been a small business owner for many, many years and it, it's anyone out there who has been knows how long it takes. These things don't happen overnight. And so we just knew that we needed to scale back, you know, for whatever, however many months we needed to, to just, you know, go lean and mean, which is one of the things that's great about this lifestyle. We travel slower. We stay in places in one location for a longer period of time, which makes your camping expenses lower, but also your fuel expenses lower. And we've been head down, tail up working so hard. So we haven't been going out for dinner and playing and spending money like we usually do. So we've actually just, you know, cut those expenses back as well. But, you know, we're, we're really, it's, it's a gradual, you know, as long as you see yourself sort of going up, gradually you're, you're heading in the right direction and we're definitely heading in the right direction we've had definitely, early really yeah. positive feedback we've had really great results where you know there's a really great saying that I, I heard once and it was that we all get paid what we're worth it just depends on what currency we're willing to accept mm -hmm. and the way that we interpret that is you know a lot of people see you know success in work or in business or in life in measured only in financial terms and then when you have this amount of money you can go and do these other things you want to do in life we've kind of flipped it on its head in saying well there's no guarantees in life with health or even you know <laughs> something happens we had two friends die just in the months before we were hitting the road you know friends not much older than us and so it's like how do we make this lifestyle happen now and there are so many creative ways you can live the rv lifestyle without spending as much as people think you know it's especially if you don't still maintain a home obviously that's like maintaining two homes so that's a different story but but in terms of um you know working together to make that sort of grow it's just it's just happening it's like whatever you put your focus and your intention on it grows it's just what happens in life that's why it's important to put your focus on what you want and not what you don't want that's why it's important to put your focus on what you're passionate about and what you believe in and be positive about that rather than negative about it because what you focus on is what grows so we're focusing on what we love we're focusing on what we do we're focusing on helping people and adding value and and it's it's just it's growing so it's it's it takes time and I think that's the other thing just be patient we you know sometimes we've had moments like anyone starting in your business where there's a bit of apprehension when Mark left his job and then we're like <gasps> There was one week, remember there was one week we were dry camping and we were both really on edge with each other and we realised, wow, it's like the rubber hits the road now. Pardon the pun, whether it's a perfect thing, the rubber hits the road now. This is really, we're, we're backing ourselves here. And when we sat down and really looked at it all logically, we just thought, you know, it, it has to work. You know, it has to succeed because we've got all the ingredients. We just need to sit down and do the work and keep showing up and, and just, you know, being grateful for what we have and just keep watering that plant and feeding it. And yeah. You know, what was interesting about it though, is that it was more of a transition than we expected in our relationship oh, because yeah. when we had, you know, the first two and a half years, two and three quarter years on the road with me having my regular job, I'd be back in my little cubicle, my mm -hmm. little office pretty much all day. You know, we'd see each other at lunch and after work and stuff, but um, we were, we would both be working during the day, um, but we weren't working together during the day. And that's a difference because we have very different styles. You know, I very different, I, very different styles. And so the, trying to, you know, merge those two working styles was that a was bit of a challenge, but it's actually great because we have very complementary skill sets. You know, one of my strengths might be my you know, weaknesses, her weakness and vice versa. Her strength is my weakness. And so, yeah. you know, it's, it took a little while to get those working together pieces to be fitting nicely. But yeah. uh, our communication styles are completely different. I'm an extrovert in case you can't tell Mark's an introvert. And so, you know, he's very quietly processes things internally and I need to talk it out to get to the answer. And so he'll just go off and do things and he's an amazing producer and gets so much stuff done. And I'm there, but like, I want to talk about this. <laughs> and so it's been a real couple of bumps in the road for us. But I've said every time we have a little, 
moment like this, I'm like, you know what, this is really good. This is just more experience to be able to talk to how to adjust to being together in a small space. And because we never really had too many issues with that when we hit the road, a lot of people ask about that. How do you live together in a small space? And we never really had those issues until it started rearing. Until we started to try until it started working together. together and space. then <laughs> it's like, oh, this is good. But it's another opportunity for growth. It's another opportunity to look at because we're in a small space, it's more important. How do we navigate this? How do, and then we had to, you know, that's all about being um, very open and honest with each other about sharing what's going on for you and then listening to the other person and then finding out ways forward. But because we know ourselves very well and we know each other very well, we can make observations that, you know what, I've noticed this and perhaps this might work better next time or how do we feel about dealing with it that way? And that, that's been good. So yeah. We're definitely works in progress with that, but I think we've been fast tracking it pretty well. We oh, yeah, we tend to dive in pretty quickly and dig into the dig in deep where we need to and work through things. And I find it interesting. You talk about how important communication is when you're talking about the um, the, the transition of going from working two separate jobs to working together. You called it interesting. He called it a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting challenge. <laughs> it's, exactly. it's, it's, it's yeah. So that's my optimist. Actually, we're both optimists, so I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah. It's been a challenge. <laughs> it's been a challenge, which has been interesting because we're just seeing and experiencing each other in different ways that we didn't before that. And, and seeing how he worked before in his job and then now seeing how that plays out in, in our relationship and, and in working together, it's like, oh, now I can see how you're, you're so good and you're so strong at producing and doing this in this area of your job and in, in our business. But in terms of how the relationship works, that's that's not quite, you know, mm. and like you, yeah. you have to remember to, you know, when you work together and you live together, and this is regardless of you're even an RV or not, this is anywhere in my, in my opinion is, you know, you've got to be able to separate the relationship from the work as well. I mean, you've got to be able to go on dates and have fun where you just don't talk about it. Otherwise you just end up becoming like roommates. And so you need to be able to have separate, time to be mm -hmm. able to be on the clock and off the clock <laughs> yeah <clears throat> and though like I said, even though it was a challenge it was just something new it was just some. it was we weren't used to it we weren't used to it it That's just didn't it we didn't expect it to be i mean it's not been a real Major problem issue. or anything it's just it was just an interesting like she said how you have it was just a whole another level of dynamic so the, well, it had all gone so smoothly. We've been super, we're super compatible. We've been together seven years. And so it was kind of the first time ever that we'd had some real little you know, <laughs> heads on things. Yeah. And it was a, oh, it was just unfamiliar. It was unfamiliar territory. So, but as always, it's like, this is good learning. It's still been great. And because what's one of the biggest gifts of our working together is we have so much more flexibility and freedom mm -hmm. now. Like, we can choose our days off whenever we want. You know, these last day and a half, we decided to go to Crater Lake in the middle of the week. And so unplugged. we can go to Totally Unplug in the middle of the week when there's not as many people in a national park mm -hmm. or when there's not. So you have that flexibility and all. Weather's gorgeous today. I want to get out on my bike today. Um, Which is Mark's during, therapy. Yeah, that's how I decompress my therapy. And that extra level of freedom working for yourself is yeah. a real gift because you can, sometimes we work till midnight, but we, in the nice. middle of the day, the weather is beautiful. We can go for a hike could go for a bike ride yeah. or something like that. And that, that level of flexibility is, you know, you can't put a price on that. It's amazing. And we're still getting used to it. It's creating, I think a routine is really important. Um, when we first hit the road, I took a lot longer to adjust the mark. I took a few months cause I didn't have a real routine of a job to show up to. I was just, creating, doing what I wanted. He had a routine with his job and his set hours. So it was easier for Mark to adjust. That was, and yeah. this is what we've noticed with working together now is we are now changing our routine. And again, we don't have a set routine. So we're still finding our groove with that, to be honest, where we're mm -hmm. still, yeah, getting into that, but observing what's working and what's not. And then we just sort of meld it to. to yeah. what but that's a good point though. That can be a real blessing to folks that are you know, wanting to transition from a traditional lifestyle to one on the road is if you have a job that you can keep and take with you, yeah. um, which a lot of jobs can. Yeah. Um, but if you decide to have that, that's one more s stable, consistent thing that will help you establish routine on the road. But um, yeah, so I think, many unknowns yeah, the there are a lot you. of unknowns. And, yeah. But I think um, that can definitely be a real blessing with that. Yeah. 
So out of curiosity, to go back a little bit to when we're talking about relationship and, and that sort of thing, um, out of curiosity, when did the like quote unquote honeymoon phase of travel kind of wear off? I know like, for example, if I go on a trip with my husband, we're, we're different people just because it's a totally different environment and there's that excitement and that curiosity and that sort of thing that goes on with everything around you when you're traveling full time. At some point that becomes the norm. Um, for you guys, did you have anything like that? Hmm, that's a really good, yeah, question. good question. I I don't feel I like can't think of anything that's happened for us. No, I've, I we think still... we're moving all the time. So yeah, you never really get. I mean, we we spent the first half of this year, so um, between two and a half and three year period on the road, pretty much in the desert southwest, and we were there longer than we would normally be because we had some commitments, you know, in that area, and we were kind of. I think maybe starting to get a little bit, I don't know, starting to get a little bit itchy feet down there. I, I don't know how to describe it, but I, I know that once we got it's going a again, <laughs> we regular travelling life and we're up in Oregon now. We just arrived in from Crater Lake just a couple of hours ago. Um, I mean, it just, to me, I feel excited and invigorated all over again. There, Oh, we're back on, a, back on the road doing our travelling lifestyle, whereas I think the first six months of this year were, were, I don't think it's that the honeymoon period wore off, but it was just a challenging period for us in general because Mark was in the last couple of months of a very stressful job that was emotionally and physically and most, um, taxing and exhausting and affecting his health. And then, you know, he left his job and then we started, you know, creating our business and creating all the content for that. So we were really busy working, you know, 16 hour days every day for yeah, so much work-life balance. Yeah, there was no work-life balance in that February, March, April. Well, March, April, May, no work-life balance. But we're back to it now. But, but I don't think that it's that the 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 honeymoon period wore off so much as we just knew that that period we just had to buckle down and get stuff done. We were laying a foundation for our future, and so it wasn't that we got sick of travel. And it's funny because we've done forty-nine states now. Yeah. And we're here revisiting some of them again, like California and Oregon, and we're heading up to Pacific Northwest, uh, Washington soon. Every time you go somewhere new, it's like even if you're going to the same places, like where we are now today in Ashland, Oregon, you're seeing it through different eyes because you're different. You're changed. You know, we're different people now than we were three years ago. And so our experience of the same place at the same time of year, pretty much the same month, yeah. probably even the same week as we were here in Ash and it still feels different. I don't, I don't yeah. know. So to the answer, I, to me, I still feel like we're in honeymoon phase on the RV lifestyle, which I've planned to continue to be. And I'm, we're still in honeymoon phase in our own relationship together yeah. seven years later too. So I think uh, that's just kind of the state we like to be in. Right. So that's, we'll just stay there. And I think that's how <laughs> we knew, I think that's how we knew George and this was the right path for us too because we just like we just feel like we're getting warmed up you know we don't feel like okay we've seen the whole country now what's next do we want to go and RV overseas in Europe Australia New Zealand absolutely that's definitely on the cards but but for yeah, now that's definitely focus is far more here. likely than us getting back into stick and break yeah but for now we're here yeah. still in North America there's still a lot more to see and do here and uh yeah we just get on rolling I'm glad to hear your travel plans are continuing into the indefinite future yeah <laughs> Well, I think I have talked enough at this point of questions that we had discussed prior to this. So um, we had several attendees email me some questions before the start of the webinar. So we're going to go ahead and tackle those. And then I've got a couple of Q&As from the live attendees as well. Um, okay. A couple of questions. Not, they don't have the answers. You do. <laughs> um, and so one of the questions I got, which I know you guys have talked about extensively on your blog and even in face-to-face -face conversations that we've had at events and that sort of thing. Do you, um, like what kind of tips do you have for the first time RVer um, if they're planning to make the leap? Not someone who's already on the road, but someone who's right there at the cusp. In terms uh, of work or the actual RVing? Um, I think they're looking more at, um, at RVing, RVing as a whole, but this is someone who's talking about work as well in the email that I received. Do your homework, do your yeah. research. I mean, Julie and I were really heavy into the research for this before we hit the road. For about and then, nine months. Yeah, nine months ahead to give yourself the confidence and comfort before you hit the road. So that'd be my 
biggest advice. And take is- your time. Don't rush it because the, especially if you have a home situation to deal with, like we sold our town home. Um, I mean, if you're, if you're just renting and you, you don't have any of those kind of responsibilities to wrap up, then that's probably less of a consideration than selling your home and all the possessions that you've accumulated over your lifetime. But Take, yeah, take your time with that because even at nine months with both of us uh, being very focused on it for that entire time, we still felt we were fast-tracking it. Yeah, there was so, still a lot to learn in the no next rush. year after that. So. Well, the, you just never stop learning, yeah. ever. Yeah. And, and I think to add to that too is just don't ever always think you know it all because, you know, you'll just always continue, you know. I mean, we're still, you know, learning. Yeah, all, that's our Everyone, advice. you know, everyone is. And you made a perfect point, um, perfect segue in what you said earlier, Mark, about being comfortable before you actually take the plunge. Um, somebody had asked, how do you make your RV more comfortable for full time? Their comment was that they've looked at a couple of floor pans and they don't even look comfortable for a week, much less indefinitely. Mm. Yeah, you, you, that's, that's critical. You, you have to find something that you feel good in and you know we've made a few modifications to ours and that you know we changed the little booth dinette to something more appropriate for two of us but one of the biggest modifications was we converted a bunkhouse model into a second office and so you know being clear with yourself knowing what the most important elements of your lifestyle are and looking for those in your rv you know for us we knew we were both going to be working full time and so we needed to have an rv that had two separate workspaces that neither of which were part of the main living area. And so and that comes back to the work life balance. It comes back to work life balance. But yeah, you know, having comfortable furniture or something, you know, if you get an older rig, you can change the furniture, but uh, right. there's little things like that you can change. But I think that's the biggest thing from making it comfortable for full time is just being really clear on what the most important elements of your lifestyle are and looking to make sure an RV fits those major elements. And to really look for a quality RV. You're much better off buying yeah. a used quality rig than a new lesser quality rig. I mean, if you can get a, a used quality rig is always going to be better because it reduces your depreciation, but something with good insulation because as RVers, you know, we go north in the summer, we go south in the winter, but even so, you still experience extremes of temperature. And, you know, I think having a good quality RV with good insulation, I mean, we've seen people RVing in some units that are not designed for RVing <laughs> at all. And I don't, I don't know if they just modified or get used to it or their tolerance everyone's got a different tolerance level i think that's the other thing is you need to know yourself well you need to know what's important to you you know you okay being you know and an, in an rv that just has a propane fridge i mean some people won't even consider an rv without a washer dryer and a residential fridge you know little <laughs> things like that i think you have to know who you are and be clear on what's important to you yeah. so then shifting back to the work side of what you do um, Allison had asked, what kind of skills do you find are most employable when it comes to RVers looking for work? Oh, um, see, that really depends, too, on the type of work you're looking for, you know, because mm -hmm. if you're like like me or like Julie, when you're able to work remotely online, then that's a different skill set. I mean, for us and for being for self-employed, that's a whole other skill set, too. But right. um, so many more companies are be are being open to people working remotely because there's so many benefits for the employer. The, mm -hmm. you know, they have a much broader geographic area to be able to pick their talent pool, um, being able to hire someone in Nevada if the company's in Texas or, you know, stuff like that. Um, but as far as employability, I think you know, if you're trying to work in person, you know, I think flexibility would be the biggest trait that's going to be desirable. Mm -hmm. But um, we met someone this week who makes his money – um, just transporting other people's trailers to other areas. You know, I mean, mm. gosh, there's so many different types of work. But. Well, obviously, you know, technical and computer skills are really important if, if that's the kind of work you want to do from your RV. 
right? That if you, you, you're tech savvy, if you're social media savvy or anything like that. But I think having a good work ethic, I mean, I don't know if that's like a skill, but I mean, if you can show that you can be trusted to do the work unsupervised, that, I mean, that's a really valuable trait. Like with yeah. you, I mean, it was never, it was never questioned with you. Is Mark mm. doing his job or is he slacking off, you know, going and hiking in the middle of the day? No, because they know him. But that, that was a company that had, you know, handpicked their management team from around the country based on what they know of them and their past performance. Um, but some... Yeah, it's you a know, tough question to answer without knowing without what kind of work what they want to do, you know? And, and but one thing I do want to say, there are so many more jobs out there, a, a, even if it's not just RVing. I think what the question really is, is that what job can I do that's not a regular job that I have to go to an office to and from every day? Because whether you want to be flexible to be able to travel or in an RV or to be going overseas to Europe or to do house sitting or to just work from home to have more flexibility. That's really what people are looking for is freedom and flexibility. Yeah. But we've met people that do, um, you know, work camping that have had a lot of physical labor type skills or landscaping skills. And there was that, that fellow we met that was in construction. That was, mm -hmm. I mean, those kind of jobs are high in demand at campgrounds, but you know, I think, but there's so many jobs too, like, you know, nursing is highly we mobile. There's so many jobs out there that you can find other places that yeah. you can, in hospitality is huge. Uh, if you, cause so many areas have their peak season for right. a tourist season. And if you're really good in the hospitality field, you know, whether it be hotel, restaurants, bars and stuff like that, you can go to where that's really in demand during that season and then move somewhere else when that's in demand in the other area. And we were on a, on a hike in Crater Lake yesterday and we got chatting to these two gentlemen. One was 72 and one was 78. They're both captains of the boats on Crater Lake. So they, during the summertime, take people on the boat tours around the lake. And off season, they're down in Mexico, um, you know, transporting boats from different locations for people to get them out of hurricane season. But in the, he was looking for a job in the summertime. I think look at your skills and experience and see what have you got and how can that be how can that be applied to something else that you're really interested in? I'm sorry that answer is maybe not that clear. It's kind of <laughs> it's kind of hard when it's generic. Like if I was sitting down with a coaching client and having one on one, we could drill in a lot deeper. But <laughs> with a generic question like that, I hope that helped a little. Well, if it helps in your answer, you answered all three of the questions that she emailed me. So good job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm kind of psychic like that. I'm a little intuitive. <laughs> good. Um, so Donna has a question, and I think this was more for you, Mark, but of course it would work for either one of you still. Um, what challenges to being on call or having to be able to respond to emails quickly did you encounter, um, such as outside noise, distractions, that sort of thing, and how did you manage those? Yeah, I think one of the, uh, the biggest challenges is weather. Like if it's raining, it's Hi. really noisy inside an RV, and so that's, that noise isolation would have been the more challenging. But we made connectivity such a priority that we were always, and I'm my, the way I was with my job, I was literally in my desk all the time. And so responding to emails promptly and stuff for me was super simple because that was just, that was all was I was there. doing. I mean, some days were so busy at my old job, you know, without getting too graphic, but this is really funny, is I can literally grab the door handle to the bathroom from my office chair and there were days that I didn't get to visit that for five and six hours at a time because my day was so intense at that other job um, but yeah, it's crazy but, um, but yeah being able to respond promptly is just a matter of being able to be connected and making it a priority during your work hours mm -hmm. so anything to add on no okay all right. So the ever important question, especially with changes that have happened in government lately, what do you guys do for health insurance? Uh, yeah, it is a good question because that was something we were faced with when I left my old employer because I've always had health insurance um, through an employer. But we decided to go with a health share program. And uh, for those who aren't familiar, it's uh, health share program it's not technically insurance it's you you pay a monthly fee to be a part of it um, and then you would pay out when you have something that you would have a claim against you would pay for it and get reimbursed but we have it through Liberty Health Share um, and they're it's just a really great program. we've heard so many people on the road that really rave about these type of programs and so with what we decided to explore and we actually feel we have far better coverage mm -hmm. through that than I ever did through my employer. And um, 
we're not big insurance users to start with, but that's a really great fit for us. That makes sense. Um, and so with that in mind, somebody asked, uh, whenever you do like sign up for insurance or things like that, what address do you give? They, they specify, do you use your escapees address, which for those of you that don't know, um, and I, I work for escapees, full disclosure, but uh, we actually have a mail service that a lot of full-time RVers will use the addresses in our mail forwarding service as their domicile. So that's what this person is asking. Um, but how do you guys negotiate that, like where you live versus your legal type of information and that sort of thing? Yeah. But that's exactly, yeah. Yeah, we, we love our Escapees mail service yeah. too. And, and because, domicile. And yeah. domicile. We set up our domicile through Escapees years ago. And in fact, we love it so much that if we ever were to have a stick and brick, we'd probably still keep that for service. We because we don't have to deal with all the junk mail, which is worth <laughs> it. what we want. That is yeah. worth it. It's <laughs> so fantastic. But, um, that having that domicile address is been really great for us. That's yeah. our address. We do everything through, um, you know, even our business we run through there, but the type of health share program that we have, it's national and in fact, international coverage. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that's um, a challenge for some States is getting insurance that's valid in the affordable care act. And right we all states on a national plan mm -hmm. um this is truly beyond national it's international and um and yeah so that works out great we just do it through yeah domicile. And, and just just touching on that domicile and and um, mail service i mean it's really important if you're doing that you change everything to that address you can't have your feet in two camps like we were from colorado and now we're texas is that that's the state of domicile that we chose and that was the best for us that's not necessarily best for everybody you need to look at but for us that was the best fit certainly at that time and you have to change everything you have to change all you know your medical providers your your um any memberships that you have you, your banks every everything so i think that's just a really important thing for people to know is that you can't you can't just go and yeah, sometimes get that and use that for some things and, and leave your other address for others. That's, that's gets, can get you into hot water if you do that. Oh yes. <laughs> um, so talking about that, this kinds of legal issues, um, Dan has asked, how do you handle state and federal taxes because you're moving around the country? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, that's a good, good question. question. Um, well, federal tax, you're going to pay regardless, um, wherever you moved. We, that was actually part of the factor, in us deciding to move quote unquote from Colorado to Texas was that Colorado has a 5% state income tax. Texas has no state income tax. And so by setting everything up in Texas, we don't have to pay state income tax. It was a 5% um, increase right there. And because my employer was out of Texas as well, but now self-employed and moving around, um, you know, we, there's a lot of states that don't have state income tax and then there's you'd have to talk to a tax advisor to get yeah. really specific details on that but every state has their own rules on how long you stay there and how much income you earn in that state to whether or not you would need to file a return and mm -hmm. so you know our income you know hasn't it just if it's not if it's not too high while you're in that state you know we California is a very aggressive state, so we don't spend a whole lot of time in California, right? So, whereas Nevada is no state tax, Washington, no state tax, Texas, no, Florida, no. Spend a lot of time there, you know, and uh, make your big money when you're in those states. Hope that answers. But you need to speak to a tax advisor to get, yeah. to like, get the specific for your own case. Yeah. Yeah. Disclaimer. Disclaimer. <laughs> But it, it, it becomes a very deep and tricky legal issue. So you want to make sure if you're someone who could be and in lots of gray areas unintentionally get legal advice so you get the best advice. <laughs> but but, but it, it can impact your travels. If you're being mm -hmm. mindful and consider that it can be impact where you go and how long you stay and how much you earn while you're there. So that's something that we another thing that we have to think about on top of all of our other travels. It is definitely an additional <laughs> complexity to travel. But Providing you want to stay legal. Yeah. <laughs> and you're yeah. in an income bracket that matters. You right. Know, some, everyone's situation is different. Some yeah. people, their incomes, you know, if they only get the income from one source and that goes into the same state that they're domiciled in, that into the accounts and all that, then, you know, it's, it's all... A lot of gray air, definitely seek professional advice, but that's at least some insight from how we do it. Mm -hmm. 
And speaking of that, um, I don't know if you guys are aware, this you probably have seen it, but I know Escapers, the um, the working art, working HRV or group of Escape Use RV Club has actually been working with ACPA, who is an RVer himself. And to let you guys know that are in, attending, whenever we send out the follow-up email that has the link to the video, in case you guys want to watch a replay, I'll make sure that I also include links to, there's several articles, there's a series of articles that Adam has written on um, importance of taxes with our with our viewers and so i'll make yeah. sure we get those in there because i've seen a couple more questions pop up about that yeah we've okay. been work, we, we just think thanks to the recommendation from melanie carr at escapees we were uh, connected to adam and we've just started working with him in the last few in months last year, yeah. yep yeah fantastic i'm glad to hear that so um, all the more fitting that his <laughs> material yeah. would be in there so <laughs> Um, and so just out of curiosity, because I'm seeing a couple more questions pop up about health insurance that we're getting close to the end of our time. Do you guys have a blog or anything like that that you've written about your experience with health insurance and the route and the ways that you've chosen that we can direct people to? Not in the blog, not an RV okay. love. Um, I mean, it is in the, in the school and in the courses that we've okay. got in the Road the Right Way course, but that's not just that. That's got a lot of different things in it, but not actually on the blog. Yeah. And that's only recently been a change. Yeah, we've talked about writing a blog post about that. But yeah, the, the one we use is Liberty Health Share. Um, mm -hmm. There's a few other health share organizations yeah, out look there. Around. Um, but uh, that's just really the best fit for us and for a lot of reasons. And, you know, for me, health care is so much more about prevention and making a lot of choices for, you know, preventative and um, but we're not big heavy users of insurance programs. You know, some folks who have, you know, long-term challenges, right. then they might have to different needs. They'll have different needs. But yeah. It's a very individual case by case basis. And really, yeah, there is no one size fits all with that. Like, like with RVs, there is no one size fits all. Yeah. But, but once, you know, once it's like with technology too, it's, it's like once you, you narrow down and what are the most important things for you? And this comes back to that, earlier question you had about RVing too is what are the most important concerns or things that you need to address and really focus your time and intention and energy on researching all the different options for those for us it was technology for someone else it will be to healthcare for someone else it'll be how to make an income on the road for someone else it'll be how to find the right RV for them or it might be all of them for you and which means you've got a lot more research <laughs> but it, yeah it's 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 I know it's not always the answer that people want to hear, but there really is no cookie cutter approach to this. And I think that's why embarking on the RV lifestyle is not, it's not as simple as, you know, coming to our blog or anyone else's blog and seeing what they do and then copying what they do. It is not that no. simple. I think you can gain a lot of insight and a lot of uh, great information and, and understanding why people made the choices what they did i think is valuable information not just this is what we did but why and what was the thought processes behind that because because if 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 it was a one size fits all everyone would be in the same rv we'd all have the same technology provider we'd all we'd all have the same yeah. setup and we don't it is so so unique to every individual person but when you're new and you're starting out you don't you don't know what you don't know and you don't know you know you, you just end up i think what i've noticed is a lot of people copy what other people are doing because they think well I like them and they do this and so it must be good and you know, I think we've seen a lot of people copy what we've done because yeah. they must like what we've written or the reasons we made those choices and they that may be the right choices for them but but it may not be just because it's the right choice that's the point I really want to make is just because a choice or a decision on anything has been right for us doesn't mean it's right for you that's why the most important thing is that you know yourself well enough or you know what questions to ask to where to focus your research and and that, that, that's easier said than done. Yeah. Sorry if it sounds like it's more complicated. But it's definitely I don't mean it to true. sound complicated, but it, it, is, it is a big, especially for people selling a home or it's a big change of lifestyle. This is not just going on a vacation. It is, it is a big it is a big shift. And, and I think the older you get, the bigger it is. Because if you're, you know, 23, you're just out of college and you're going and doing something like that, you, you've got less to lose than somebody who's yeah. 55 and you know or Live 65 in and living in the community yeah. leaving their kids or grandkids selling their home this is rv is going to be their home what do they get i mean it, it becomes i think the older you get and the more uh things in your life that are established the more decisions you need to make the more research you need to do because you've got less to lose when you're young you go oh, if it doesn't work out i'll go to do something else but the stakes are higher it's true i mean we find that you know now to when we were 20 years ago 
the, there's just a lot more to think about and consider because there's more at stake. But, you know, the oh, yeah, great right. thing is there, there are solutions out there for everything. I think that's the one thing if people come away, don't, don't come away feeling like it's too much or it's overwhelming. There are a lot of people doing this Absolutely. and we're, and we're a lot of people loving this and, you know, some more than others. But, you know, I think if you focus on the ones that are really doing it well and making good choices and you can learn through those, then, you know, you'll find a way that works for you because it really is such an individual journey. Definitely. Um, and one quick question before we get to our last question. Um, there's been several questions. How many times can I say question in the same sentence about um, your technology choices? How do you stay connected? Well, we used to have everything Verizon, but when my work changed, when we started it was AT&T. Yeah, we started. Yeah, we started it was AT&T and Verizon, and then Verizon became a clear winner. In um, week one. <laughs> week one. And then, um, you know, when we transitioned out of my old job, our connectivity needs, our no amount of data and the connectivity importance both reduced. And so... Because we had more flexibility. Yeah, because we had that extra flexibility. And so we were able to cut our bills in half by putting our phones on T-Mobile and still maintaining the MiFi um, for the main data on Verizon. And because we have iPhones, we can actually make phone calls over Wi-Fi over the Verizon. So we basically have that Verizon coverage all the time. But, right. you know, if you want really tech, that's how we make it work for us. If you want really technical stuff, Technomania, you know, the mobile RV internet. Mobile internet, Chris RV, and Cherie. Yeah, the mobile Everyone internet. knows those guys. And if they don't, you need to know those guys. Because these, yeah. we get those questions all the time about what we do. And again, it's following with what we just said, that's what works for us. And that's what works for us at this point in time with our current circumstances, yeah, which has changed from three months ago. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just really knowing what your needs are. We used to have two separate MyFi's. We had one each because I couldn't be on the internet or uploading YouTube videos and slowing down Mark's conference calls. So we had to have completely separate Wi-Fi's. We, we only need one now, so we are able to drop, drop one off. But yeah. 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 Um, but Verizon, I think, you'll find is across the board. If you're looking for one, wanting to keep it simple and one carrier across the board, Verizon definitely has the strongest network nationally. I think currently T-Mobile is working pretty hard to um, catch up, but you know, time will tell. Yep. And again, if you guys are escapees members, if any of the attendees are escape members, escapees members, um, we actually have been offered a discount code from Technomadia from Chris and Cherie for their RV mobile internet. Um, and I'll go ahead and make sure we include that in that follow-up email too. That way, if you guys are interested, you can look into it. And if you aren't escape, escape these members, unfortunately, it doesn't work for you, but you can always join. It's only $40 a year. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because escapees is so much more than what on the surface. I mean, we love the advocacy. We love everything that Escapees does. There's so much great Community information there. Huge. Community Yeah, we've connected with so many people through mm. Escapers and Escapees. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I would encourage anybody to join that. So yeah, it's money well spent. It's and very... not just for the discount to the mobile internet. No, but it's a small <laughs> investment. What is it like 40 bucks a year or something like that. And one of the things that we really appreciate about about Escapees, you know, one of the many things is, is the advocacy that you do for the RVing community. I mean, we're a very small percentage of the overall population as full-time RVers. And, you know, our, uh, SKPs has done so much work over the years to create rights for us that didn't exist before. And so that's why, you know, just being a part of a, an organisation that is looking out for your interests, I mean, if, if that's not worth 40 bucks a year to you, you really need to reconsider whether or not you want to be a full-time RV. <laughs> But, it, you know, it's, we, we join organizations that, you know, support our values and our goals and, and what we want to achieve in life. And so um, Escapees has been great for us in multiple levels. And, yeah. Well, I appreciate all that. I mean, you guys are a huge part of the organization and people like you are the reason why we're still around almost 40 years later. So yeah. you guys are a huge part of it, too. It's not all, it's not all headquarters. It's a lot of our members. <laughs> <laughs> um, but our last question to wrap up, and this also came from Allison, who was asking about the um, the work questions earlier, the employment questions. Mm -hmm. She says, if you knew that you would be full time in five years, how would you prepare for that? And this is, this is probably relevant to a lot of the people that are here in attendance as well. Newbies who are on there thinking that they're going to be full time um, five years from now. Yeah, start. You can't start planning too soon in my opinion mm. things are going to change in the rv world in terms of 
actual RVs available in terms of, you know, campgrounds and that kind of a thing. But the, the basics are there, the building blocks, for want of a better word, is there. Um, I think getting your financial situation uh, sorted out in advance if, is really high priority because I think if you hit the road not having the finance, financial piece dialed in, people do it, but it adds a whole other layer of stress and that's that doesn't make it fun and enjoyable if you're wor worrying about where is my money coming from to, you know, pay for food or pay for my gas. I mean, so financial is number one. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and just, you know, doing all your education as much as you can now. But, you know, the the, the thing to get ready in five years, it would so, depend so much on each person. You can downsize. But, yeah. Yeah, actually. Start that'd be offloading a good, stuff. That would be a really good first <laughs> step is start learning to live a more simple life so that it's an easier transition into an RV. So, you know, if you are mm -hmm. currently in a 7,000 square foot house, mm -hmm. you're going to have quite a ways to adjust. You might as well sit, start adjusting sooner. So that's what we did when we were in Colorado. I mean, it was winter and it was snowy and cold outside. And we we're like, well, what can we do to get us closer to our RV and goal now? So we went through the town home and we pulled out all the cupboards and everything in storage and started selling stuff on Craigslist and scanning and digitizing uh, files of documentation and photos and things like that. So you can start, I mean, there's a lot to do. There's a lot. So the sooner you can start that, but you know, start um, reading blogs, watching YouTube videos, that kind of a thing. Um, obviously there's educational platforms out there, you know, like, you know, ours and like escapees. I mean, there's a lot of education out there. And one thing I would say is that, you know, remember this is a big lifestyle change that we're all doing and it's a big investment, whether you're buying a, you know, $10,000 RV or a, you know, $500,000 RV. And we've met people from every, every yeah. end of the spectrum. It's a big investment. And, you know, I think, Investing in your knowledge and your education is critical because any mistake you make in the RV life is not an inexpensive mistake. <laughs> you can have your RV GPS take you off on the wrong road or you can buy an RV and it ends up not being the right one for you. And, you know, you're going to lose money on that. Very rarely do people make money when they sell an RV and try and find the next one. You know, safety issues, um, how to get things set up. You know, we were talking a lot about mail and domicile. I mean, all of those kinds of things, the more educated and the better planned. I mean, I think we were six months on the road when we got our mail system dialed in because we wanted to be sure we were going to keep doing that before we, so we had family take care of it the first six months. But, you know, knowing if you really know you're going to be full time, start getting your mail stuff sorted out now. You know, yeah. Do as much advance as you can. Yeah, so. yeah. Do a lot. Do a lot of research. Go, and, and I think always be prepared to question your um, what you've narrowed it down to right up until the end. Because we thought we knew what was the right RV that we were going to buy, and then and then it was when Mark, you know, really highlighted this work life balance, how important that was to him, and to close the door in his office at the end of the day. You know, in at the final stages, we we totally thought this other RV was perfect for us, and then we realised that means his office is in the living space and that's really high value for it not to be. So we completely changed the kind of RV that we were getting and that, that just getting clear perfect on perfect for us. Yeah. So the, I guess the big message, clear you get on, your finances together, but also just get clear on what your, your why. I think yeah. that's a huge factor having success on getting the road yeah. is finding your why. If you're clear on why you want to go live the lifestyle, that is one of the biggest pieces and that will guide a lot of the other major decisions mm -hmm. and get you on the road to success. Yeah. Well, that is some really fantastic advice. That's good life advice too. Before you make a big decision, why are you doing it? That's, that's, pre that's a pretty good point. <laughs> well, well, thank you both so much for taking, I mean, the last more than an hour of your evening sharing it with us. We really appreciate it. And you have been such a wealth of information. Um, I cannot thank you enough. Thanks. Thank you oh, so thanks much for having, having us. It's such a joy. We always love seeing you, and it's even if it's just on the screens. All right. All right. Well, thanks. And if anyone has any questions that we haven't covered, you know, you know where we are. Just reach out with an email, and happy to help. All right. <laughs> we love you guys. We've, this has been such an unexpected joy and bonus to us hitting the road. We just never imagined how big and how loving and how supportive this community is. So friendly and generous and helpful. The whole RVing community is. Um, God, I mean, we, we could talk for another half an hour about that, but yeah. I won't. But <laughs> all you guys, uh, thank you all for sharing the journey and for, for being here with us today.
Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. You too. And have a good night, guys. Thank you. Bye.